So we're going to provide, um, this webinar will provide a, a very general introduction to uh, Hemiptera as a whole, uh, focusing really on, on the British fauna and giving you some background um, to it. So a good place to start really is to define what we mean by Hemiptera. Um, and the order is characterized by the possession of piercing and sucking mouth parts. So all Hemiptera have a, a feeding tube, which is called a rostrum. And this is segmented and they use it to, to feed on, um, on usually plant sap, but sometimes other fluids from, from animal tissues. They're very variable in size, so they can be really, really tiny, just like the size of an aphid millimeters or something very much larger. And they're incredibly diverse in terms of their ecology. They can be found in a huge range of habitats. Uh, some of these don't actually contain any other insects at all. So there's a kind of pond skater called Halobates that lives on the surface of the sea. And this is a really a remarkable ecological niche for, for an insect. They are mostly tropical. So you, you'll find far more different families and different species in the tropics or warm areas. And they're very much heat loving insects in general. In Britain, there's about 2000 species and this is rising every year as uh, our fauna is very, very dynamic. This is largely a result of uh, gradual climatic change, but also um, due to the introduction of new species in, in horticultural produce and so on. So this figure compares with about 2,500 butterflies and moths, 4,000 beetles and, and 7,000 flies. So there's a reasonable number. So here are some examples of an absolutely gigantic bug. This is Lethoceros, which is the largest European bug. It's a water bug. So it lives under the surface of the water, highly predatory. It's in this family, Belastomatidae, which there aren't any representatives of in Britain. And it's huge. It's about six to eight centimeters long. Uh, and next to it here, a very, very tiny, uh, unrecognizable in that photograph bug. It's about two millimeters long, less than that perhaps. I think it's a lace bug. I just picked something tiny. So a huge range of sizes. And so here are uh, three photos of bugs showing this feeding tube, this rostrum. So here we have a plant bug using its rostrum to feed on a leaf. Uh, here we have a leaf hopper and it's piercing the mid vein of this leaf uh, with its rostrum here. And here we have a predatory bug. This is a damsel bug uh, and it's using its rostrum to feed actually on another bug, uh, another leaf hopper, which is the prey. So the, the hemiptera are divided into several suborders, uh, three suborders, and we're gonna talk about two of those today. The first is the suborder Heteroptera, and this includes quite a lot of things you're probably familiar with. All the shield bugs are, are in this group. The antennae have four or five very similar segments, quite large segments, and the forewings are always divided into two regions, which are hardened at the base and, and usually sort of leathery, and then very membranous and clear at the tip. And these two forewings overlap at the end uh, around this triangular scutellum. So here in this green shield bug, you can see the two wings overlapping at the end, such that these membranous bits are lying on top of each other. And they're overlapping around this, this large triangular scutellum. Uh, in addition to these features, the rostrum always arises at the front of the head. And most of these are terrestrial, but this group does include all the water bugs as well. So here are some more photos of typical uh, heteroptera. And you can see here a plant bug, a myriad, and here's the triangular scutellum, the membranous tip and the leathery basal area to the forewings. 
Here we have a ground bug, a ligade, and again, you can see the triangular scutellum. Here is a corade. This is the scutellum here. And in this species, a ropalid, not only are the wing tips rather membranous, well, completely membranous, but the forewings are also rather membranous too. Uh, and you can see this membrane between the wing veins. So the second order we're going to discuss today is the Orchinorhynchia, and this is the leafhoppers and allies, it's about 400 species. And these look really very, very different. The antennae have just a very small number of segments with a very thin terminal tip. So this tiny little bristle here, that's the end of the antenna. The wings are uniform, it's important difference, and they don't overlap, and they're held over the body like a tent. And the rostrum arises underneath the head between the front legs. This is a really uh, diverse group, so there's lots of different families in it. Um, not quite so many in Britain, but it includes all the leafhoppers uh, and the allied families. And here are some examples of Orchinorhynchia. Uh, so here we've got leaf hoppers, here we have a frog hopper, uh, and here we have a, a six-eared plant hopper. And here you can quite nicely see the rostrum pointing backwards between the legs. Right, so the third suborder is the Sternorhynchia, and this is a large, a large suborder. It contains all the aphids, um, which are numerous and also the smaller groups of scale insects and psyllids. And these really are the sort of province of the specialist. They, they require rather involved techniques like um, squashing body parts, staining them, using slides. And it's uh, rather more difficult for the non-specialist to get into them. So really the people that look at those are usually interested in, in, in pests. And, so we're not going to concern ourselves with, with them any further today. So this webinar really is just going to look at Heteroptera and Orchinorhynchia, and we're just going to think about terrestrial Heteroptera. And so now we're going to take a look at the sort of general overview of their biology, and I'm going to take you through how to recognise some of the main families um, within, within these two big groups. So if we start with the, with the uh, terrestrial Heteroptera, well, actually, uh, before that, um, why should we get interested in, in these two groups? Um, why should we study them further and record them? So there are a good number of species. As I said, there's about 450 of each or 500 uh, hets. So it's not an unmanageable number, but it's a good number to get your teeth into. They're often really, really numerous. So if you go into a grassland with a sweep net, for example, you're going to find hundreds and hundreds of bugs in the middle of the summer. And although they've got a bit of a difficult reputation and there's not a lot of easily available published literature about them that's at all modern, they are actually readily identifiable in the field to, to a degree and many are quite distinctive once you know them. They're quite taxonomically stable, so there are no really nightmarish, well, not many really nightmarish taxonomic problems to um, get too concerned about. And we know quite a lot about their ecology, um, what they do, what they need to survive. We know uh, a reasonable amount about the host plants that they require, where they occur, um, and how common they are in those habitats. So as a result of this, they're, they're quite useful indicators of, of site quality. And this is particularly the case because they're mostly plant feeding. So they will tell you a lot about a site and, and in fact, more than just looking at the plants because certain bugs have very, very specific ecological requirements. So for example, many feed on a uh, common plant like a stinging nettle, but you'll never ever find all the bugs that feed on stinging nettles uh, on, on one site. So they'll always have slightly different requirements. So and they can tell you a great deal, particularly if you look at other plant feeding insects in combination, things like weevils and uh, leaf feeding beetles, really, really useful indicators. 
They're also quite under-recorded, so there's a, a lot of potential for anyone to make a real difference to the knowledge base, and that doesn't really matter where you live. Uh, they're really under-recorded in some areas, so you can you know, contribute a lot. They're also very dynamic, as I said earlier. So, you know, there's a real chance that you could find something quite interesting, either new to a, a certain area or even new to Britain. And last but not least, they're often really um, very colorful uh, and attractive insects. So if we talk now uh, about the terrestrial heteroptera and uh, have a look at those. So some people do confuse terrestrial bugs with beetles, and it's entirely possible to do this. However, you won't fall into that trap if you, if you just take into account the following features. So beetles will never have forewings that overlap. So they always have these very uniform forewings that are parallel and they don't overlap and they have a very small scutellum. It's a scutellum here on this lesser stag beetle very small scutellum on the longhorn beetle and again in this weevil. So bugs in contrast have quite a big triangular scutellum. They'll always have chewing mouth parts, so bugs can't chew, they can only suck. And if beetles do have a rostrum, it's always points forward and it's not segmented. So in this weevil, uh, which does have this rostrum, the mouth parts are located at the tip and, the, and they are in fact chewing mouth parts. Another group that you might possibly confuse with heteroptera are the cockroaches because they have quite uh, leathery forewings with, with this overlapping area at the end. However, uh, if you look at the antennae, you'll see they're completely different. They have these very filiform antennae with lots and lots of little tiny segments in them. And there are not very many species, just three in Britain. Right, so let's have a look at the basic anatomy of uh, heteropteran. There are a couple of terms that are uh, quite unique to this group and not really used for any other insects. So in particular, this, this area, the clavus, this is this area here next to the scutellum. So here's the scutellum and then next to it on either side on each forewing, you've got this, this demarcated bit called the clavus. The remainder of the forewing is called the corium, uh, except in some groups of bugs, you have this thing called the cuneus, which is a demarcated triangular region at the tip of the corium. And this is particularly um, prominent in some groups like plant bugs. The vertex is also used uh, to describe the area between the eyes. I think this is quite often uh, used to describe Hymenoptera uh, as well, and possibly some other groups. Right, so an important characteristic uh, in HETs is ocelli. And you often, the keys often ask you um, <clears throat> whether you can see them in a, spe a specimen or whether a specimen lacks them. And so it's important to go over what they are, where they are, and um, how, how prominent they are. So they're basically a pair of simple eyes on top of the head, so between these large compound eyes. And in this family here, which is a, a ropalid, family ropalidae, you can see they're, they're really quite large, obvious structures. They're also colored red. So they, they're, they're very obvious in that case. In this, in this bug here, this is a ligaid in the ligaidae. Uh, they're really much harder to see. And this is the case if you're looking with a microscope as well as just in a photograph. Uh, and particularly once, um, once a bug is dead, they can, be, they can fade a bit. So this is, these are important features um, to bear in mind. How do you distinguish the sexes? So in general, males are usually a little bit thinner uh, and smaller, so they're more elongate. So this is a male plant bug, uh, and this is a female, a little bit broader, a bit more oval in shape. If we look underneath the abdomen, uh, you can see a really quite different morphology at the tip of the abdomen. So this is a male, and it has 
quite an asymmetrical uh, and complete genital capsule in contrast to a female, which has this really big median split in the, the capsule. And this is where the ovipositor lives. This is uh, the structure that the females use to lay eggs. So it's, it's in, in this groove and these two areas on either side are, are the valves. Right, so all hemiptera are examples of insects that undergo incomplete metamorphosis. Um, and this is in contrast to most other orders like butterflies and moths, beetles and flies. So all these have a, have a pupil stage and they also have adults and larvae that usually look really different. So hemiptera don't. Um, so these larvae resemble smaller wingless versions of the adults and they're, they're usually referred to as nymphs. So this is uh, the same as you'll find in um, Orthoptera, which also had nymphs where the, the young are similar to the, to the adults, but wingless. And as well as looking similar to the adults, they also usually have a very similar ecology. So the, the, the nymphs and the adults of, of most bugs will behave in similar ways. They'll feed on the same things, be found in the same habitats. Um, it's exactly the same niche, really. Um, so there are, there are normally five of these, these nymphal instars between the egg and the adult. And this shows the life cycle of a, a juniper shield bug. So here we've got the eggs laid on juniper. These will hatch um, to give a very small early instar nymph. This will grow and molt. And in the final molt, it will produce these wing buds here. Um, sorry, um, the um, penultimate molt produce this final instar with the wing buds. And then the final molt to adult, these wing buds will produce complete wings. Um, and here is the adult. The life cycle normally takes about a, um, a month, slight or more to complete. Um, usually in Britain, species have just one or two generations a year. Uh, occasionally you get species that will just continue breeding throughout the whole um, field season and, and these might be able to do three or four, but that's unusual, but it's becoming increasingly common. And there's a variety of strategies in terms of phenology and how these insects um, overwinter. So within the heteroptera, a lot of species overwinter as eggs. So all the plant bugs virtually will overwinter as an egg, which is laid in plant tissue. This will hatch. The adults will develop over the summer. So there'll be this very big adult peak uh, over the summer. Um, the other strategies are overwintering as an adult. So adults will emerge from hibernation. So there'll be a peak in the spring and they'll mate. Um, the nymphs will grow up over the summer uh, and the new generation will be complete by the late summer and autumn. And a lot of shield bugs will do this and also uh, the ground bugs, the ligaids. Uh, comparatively few species will overwinter as a nymph. This is a, a, an uncommon strategy. So a bit of um, biology now really about um, various features which are quite prominent in these insects. So they have scent glands which produce these quite strong uh, anti-predator defenses, so, so-called repugnatorial fluid. And you might have noticed this if you've ever uh, handled a sort of sizable shield bug, or particularly if you capture very large numbers of, of, of much smaller bugs in a net, they can give off a detectable smell en masse. And this will often smell like kind of washing up liquid, a lemony smell, or it could smell of sort of coconut. It's a very volatile smell. Um, and this fluid is secreted from scent glands. Um, and these can be on the thorax or at the side of the abdomen. So in these shield bug nymphs, the scent glands <coughs> are, are located on the, on the surface of the abdomen. Uh, and so here are the, here are the openings. But in, in adults, the scent glands actually uh, open on the side of the thorax. So here, this slit, you can see is the, the opening of the stink gland. Now this bit of cuticle around the stink gland, this is very interesting. It's called the uh, evaporative area. So 
when the chemicals are secreted, they will evaporate from this, this specialized region of cuticle. And obviously, uh, the chemicals need to evaporate very quickly. And if we look at this area under a, a microscope, uh, electron microscope, you can see why. Because it's thrown up into all these incredibly intricate folds um, <clears throat> and uh, has a, an amazingly um, sort of intricate structure with a huge number of grooves and ridges um, and, a, and a kind of mesh. And all this sculpturing serves to massively increase the surface area over which the evaporation takes place so that it happens very quickly. So I move on um, to say a bit about uh, how these uh, heteroptera feed now and what they do. And as I said earlier, I think most of them plant feeding, phytophagus. Uh, so they're, they're the sucking plant sap using uh, these, these piercing mouth parts, the rostrum. But in terms of their ecology, the variety of food plants um, varies hugely. So some species which are very generalized will feed on a huge diversity of plants in many different families potentially. So this uh, <clears throat> very common mirrored bug, uh, Clostrotomus norvegicus, will feed on a massive range of, of species. Then uh, a slightly more specialized strategy uh, shown by this, this species. This is um, a, a, a rhombic shield bug, Cyromastis. Uh, Cyromastis. So this, this feeds just on members of the Caryophyllaceae. Um, so just one family of plants. And then this is a truly monophagous species. This is a mistletoe feeding plant bug. And so this is just found on mistletoe. Um, and a, a difficult species to find actually, because mistletoe is usually rather inaccessible. So as well as plant feeding uh, species, there are a variety of other um, things that, that they can do. So we have a fairly small number of predatory bugs. So this is a mirrored bug feeding on some other insect eggs. And this is a truly um, predatory bug, which will capture other live insects, an assassin bug. Um, a very small number feed on fungi. This is a bark bug which lives under quite tightly close fitting bark. And this is uh, Mycetophagus. Uh, and just a very small number will feed on blood. Uh, there are a couple of bed bugs, uh, as well as the human species. There are uh, ones that will feed on, uh, there is, there's a species on um, bats and a species on uh, house martins and, and hirundines. Uh, but that's a, a very restricted number of species uh, in Britain. So an important thing to realize is that unlike beetles, there are no truly saproxylic dead wood feeding bugs. You might find some Mycetophagus species uh, in saproxylic habitats, but they're not truly uh, saproxylic. And also, if you're not into poking about in dung and carrion, you don't have to get too messy looking for these insects because you won't find any, any, any bugs in either of those habitats. Right, so this is quite a tricky subject area and this is something that people find um, quite confusing, particularly to start with. So the, the wing length in heteroptera can really vary quite a lot. So both within and between species. And when we have a species or an individual that is very fully winged, where the wings are as long or longer than the abdomen, we call it macropterous. So this species here, Nabis ferus, the wings are always really long, um, usually longer than the abdomen. Uh, this nabid, Nabis rugosus, uh, the common damsel bug, this is usually what we call brachypterous, so the wings are uh, usually shorter than the abdomen, only just shorter than the abdomen. And if a bug has non-functional, very tiny wings, we call it micropterous. And so these wings are really, really short in comparison to the abdomen, and they're, they're obviously uh, not capable of uh, making the insect fly. So it can be difficult to tell the difference between a wing bud, i.e. a final instar nymph, and a micropterous adult. But if you look really carefully, even in these micropterous adults, you will still see that they have a tiny little bit of wing membrane. So they are in fact adult. 
So wing dimorphism can also vary um, within the sexes and between the sexes. So in something like this uh, common uh, European cinch bug, Ischnodemus, um, you can get a huge number of different wing forms in a population, but only the long wing forms can fly and disperse. Uh, and obviously these, the development of these long wing forms is determined by environmental pressures. So once population density becomes very high or the habitat quality declines, food availability goes down, then more of them will be produced and, and um, dispersal can take place. In some species, the wing, dimorph the, the wing dimorphism is fixed between the sexes. And this can be really confusing as well, because it can mean that the males and females can look completely different. As well as their different body shapes, they have these different wing lengths. So in this species, Orthonotus rufifrons, for example, this is a nettle feeder. Uh, the males will uh, be fully winged and the females will, will be partly winged and they really look very different indeed. Um, so just a word about uh, some quite interesting parasitoids of Heteroptera. So you often find um, shield bugs in the Acanthosomatidae family. So this is things like the hawthorn shield bug, birch shield bug, uh, with these, these eggs uh, of tachinid flies attached. So in this uh, parent bug here, there are two eggs attached to its pronotum. And these will develop into um, larvae, which hatch, develop inside the bug and hatch into this fly, Subclitia rotundi ventris. And here is an amazing photo of an adult uh, fly laying eggs onto uh, nymphs and adults of, of, these, um, of these parent bugs. There are other tachinid flies which will actually penetrate the cuticle directly and lay their eggs directly inside the bug. Uh, an example of these is Phasia hemiptera, uh, and that parasitizes things like green shield bug and, and red legged shield bug. And this little tachinid fly, Gymnosoma nitens, this is uh, a specific parasitoid of quite a rare shield bug, Skyacoris curzitans, the, the sand runner shield bug. So uh, that's an example of a very specific relationship. There's also uh, an interesting predatory solitary wasp, which stocks its nest exclusively with shield bug, usually nymphs, final instar nymphs, and that's called a starter boops. Uh, and here's a female starter boops with the nymph uh, of a hawthorn shield bug. So this is going to take this prey back to its nest, lay its eggs uh, on the on the shield bug and, and its larvae will develop uh, on, on it. Right, so within the terrestrial heteroptera, we've got about 500 species and there's 21 families. Uh, now, just as I took over the shield bug recording scheme, um, this, this was actually split into two very large groups. So we have uh, now the shield bugs and allies um, which are a separate entity in terms of the recording scheme. And they're the half that I look after. And they include the five shield bug families, uh, as well as the allied Choreidae and Ropalidae. And they're a small, a small group um, of, of really, but really popular and well-recorded insects. So um, what we've essentially got a, a a small group of species that are much better recorded, and then a very large group um, of species which are less well recorded. So it sort of equates to about the same amount of work. So this second group is the plant bugs and allies, and this includes this very large family, the Myridae, which has about 400 plus species in it. And they're often uh, really difficult to identify, and, and that's perhaps the reason why they're less well recorded. So I'm just going to go through some of the main families now um, within the, the Heteroptera. So to start with the shield bugs and allies. So the Acanthosomatidae, I've mentioned these just now in relation to the parasitoids. So there are four species in Britain and they're all quite big shield shaped bugs. So we've got the birch shield bug here, hawthorn shield bug, juniper shield bug, and the parent bug. 
they've got five antennal segments, like all the shield bugs, uh, all the, the pentatomid shield, well, pentatomoidia, so-called pentatomoidia. Um, and an important feature is that they're the only shield bugs with two segments to the tarsi. So if you like the foot, the tarsus only has two segments. And if you turn them over and look underneath, they've got a forward pointing spine on the underside of the abdomen. This is really hard, to, well, it's impossible to see in pictures, but it's a very important feature um, that characterizes this family. They all feed on uh, vegetation. They're all on trees and woody shrubs and they all overwinter as adults. And of course, as, uh, as many of you might know, the, the parent bug is one of the few examples of uh, a heteropteran that cares for its young. So you'll see the, the females brooding these egg batches. And these four species are all common and widespread and you're very likely to come across them. So the, the, penta, the pentatomidae, um, and these are the more sort of typical, really classic shield bugs. There are 20 in Britain, uh, all very shield shaped. They vary in size from about four to 15 millimeters. Again, they've got five antennal segments. They have three segmented tarsi. They've got a large scutellum, um, but not usually reaching the end of the abdomen, um, except in this one species, Podopsinuncta, the, uh, um, the turtle bug. And in this has a very large scutellum that does in fact reach the end of the abdomen. Most of them overwinter as adults. Um, occasionally they will overwinter as nymphs, the forest bug, uh, sorry, red-legged shield bug, Pentatoma rufipes, um, and um, the spine shield bug, Pychromerus bidens, overwinters uh, as eggs. So, but these, this is an unusual strategy. Again, many of these are common and widespread. You will find them in, in, in your garden, particularly things like the green shield bug. Uh, Scutellaridae, uh, there are only four of these in Britain. Again, they're, they're not very diverse here. Again, they're big, usually quite big bugs. Again, they've got five antennal segments and three segments of the tarsi. And they've got this very large scutellum that reaches the end of the abdomen. Uh, they're all feeding on plants uh, and most of them overwinter as adults. So only one of the four is really common and this is Urigaster testudinaria. Um, the, the, uh, the, the tortoise shield bug. This is the most, uh, the, the most, the one you're most likely to find, perhaps. So the Sydney D. Um, these are, are burrowing shield bugs, if you like. There are eight in Britain, and um, possibly a few more actually now. They're usually black or black and white, and they've got very strong spines on the legs, and they use these for burrowing. So in the tropics, these can go down really deep, then go down about two meters apparently. And they're always quite strongly ground dwelling. So the way to find these is often to grub around on the ground underneath their food plants. In the spring, they will come up uh, onto the vegetation and feed more obviously. Um, they're all plant feeding and usually they just have one or a small number of, of host plants and they all overwinter as adults. Uh, the Choreidae, so we're out of the, the, the pentatomoidea now, we're into the corioidea, but they're still considered to be allies of the shield bugs. Um, so they, these have four antennal segments. Again, they have uh, three segmented tarsi. They're really stoutly built sort of leathery textured bugs and uh, the Americans call them leather bugs. They often have the body and particularly the head and pronotum and, and first antennal segment rather sort of coarse in texture and covered in tubercles. So they look quite roughened. They're all plant feeding, they all overwinter as adults. And there are now quite a number of common ones as well as this dock, uh, dock bug. Um, there is Gonoceros the box bug, which has become really very widespread now. It used to be an extremely rare species, but it's uh, undergone a massive range expansion and um, is now found on many other plants beside, besides box. This group also includes Leptoglossus, the spectacular relatively recent arrival. This is American, a native to America. It has these uh, expanded hind legs, leaf with these leaf-like expansions and it's a huge spectacular species 
found on pine trees uh, and it likes to overwinter indoors and quite a lot of the records are, are from houses in, in the early winter. The Ropalidae, again, these are allied to the, the true shield bugs. Um, there are about 11 species. Again, they have four antennal segments. Um, they have these very membranous forewings, as well as the tip of the wing membranous, they have the basal area membranous between uh, the veins. And the, the, the actual wing membrane has loads and loads of veins in it. They're really closely packed can be really hard to see because there are actually so many veins in the wing membrane. They're all plant feeding, they all overwinter as adults. Um, there are not very many really common ones. Perhaps the commonest is this uh, top species, Ropalus subrufus. So we come to the Myridae. Uh, we're into the other half of the recording scheme now, the plant bugs and allies. And this family is uh, hugely numerous, there's about 200 species, well, f if in excess of 200 species. Now they're all, almost all, really quite delicate, soft-bodied insects. Um, a good guide to, to a myriad is, if it's something that you collect and it falls apart quite quickly, then there's a good chance that it's a myriad. So they're really fragile, they desiccate very rapidly, um, very variable, in size and shape, as you'd expect in a, a group that contains lots of species. They've got four antennal segments. Um, they have this, as I mentioned before, this often they have this very prominent cuneus. So here we can see this demarcated triangular region uh, towards the tip of the, of the wing. Most of them feed on plants, as the name suggests. Some of them are predatory. Um, and most of them will overwinter as eggs, although there's <coughs> a small number that hibernate uh, as adults. Um, the Ligaeidae, so this is uh, the second largest family within this group, and they're quite variable in form, um, although most of them are predominantly black and dark brown, and they have four antennal segments uh, again, and a, a particular feature of them is that they have five uh, wing veins in the membrane and never more than that. This can be really hard to see. You can see it quite nicely in this species here. You can actually see the dark veins in the, in the pale membrane. They're often called ground bugs and they're really ground dwelling, very strongly ground dwelling. There are a small number of species that uh, in contrast live on trees that are arboreal. One of these is the birch catkin bug, a very common species. Uh, and all of these are plant feeding and they all overwinter as adults. The tingidae, often called the lace bugs, this is quite a small family in Britain. So they have um, very unusually um, intricate forewings with a, an appearance um, which looks like the wings are composed of lots and lots of closed cells which gives them a kind of lace-like pattern. So particularly obvious in this species here. And they have four antennal segments again, but uh, the tarsi only have two segments. The wing membrane usually quite poorly differentiated. You can see that well in uh, this, this species and also this one. Um, and they're usually monophagous. In fact, I think, yeah, all but one of our species is monophagous. And if you, if you sweep or look on thistles, you'll find two common species, Tingis cardui and Tingis ampliata. The Baritidae, these are often called the stilt bugs. So they're very elongate and they have a, a club at the end of the antenna. So the final segment will be clubbed and quite often darkened as well. Uh, they're all plant feeding and they will overwinter as adults. Um, the bark bugs, these are a very small family. They're extremely flattened uh, and they're the ones that will feed on fungi and you might find uh, under and around dead wood. Again, they have two, two tarsal segments. And they have very short, robust antennae usually. Okay, so that concludes the sort of overview of um, the heteroptera. So now we're going to talk about the um, Orchenorhynchia, the leaf hoppers and allies. The terminology is fairly similar to what we've seen in the hets. 
Um, again, they have ocelli. These are either on the top of the head, uh, on the face, or on the junction between the top of the head and the face. Um, again, they have triangular scutellum, and uh, they hold their forewings tent-like over the abdomen. Um, there are nine families in um, Britain, and these are found within um, two major groupings, the cicadomorpha and the fulgoromorpha. And the cicadomorpha contains by far the largest number of species. So all the leaf hoppers um, are within this group. The fulgoromorpha contains the plant hoppers uh, and it's a smaller, uh, quite, a, quite a lot smaller group. The largest family just has about 70 species in it. Also within the cicadomorpha, you'll find the frog hoppers, which is about 10 species, the new forest cicada, which is just one, and our two tree hoppers, the, uh, the membracidae. And how do you tell the difference between these two families? Well, these two major groupings. Well, usually the cicadomorpha uh, will have a, a, a very flat featureless face um, without any, any sort of lines on it or keels. The fulgoromorpha, they'll always have these, these very prominent keels on the face. You can see that here. Again, a comparison of the anatomy of these two major groupings, and you can see the fulgoromorpha showing these keels very strongly here, whereas the face, uh, the cicadomorpha, this is a leafhopper, um, is plain without such, such structures. So a very simple starting point when you're setting out to separate these, these groupings within the, the leafhoppers and allies is to look at the, the hind leg. So if you look at the, um, the tibia, which is this part of the leg here, um, you can see that these three groupings have quite a different appearance. So in the cicadelidae, the leaf hoppers, uh, the, the tibia has large number of parallel spines all the way down it. In this grouping, the Cecopidae and the Aphrophoridae, the frog hoppers, the tibia has a cluster of spines at the end and just has a couple of small spines uh, along its length, sort of stout spines. Then in this group, the Delphacidae, this is um, one of the groups of plant hoppers, there's a really unique structure at the end of the tibia, and this is called the, uh, the calcar. Um, and it's a really big inward pointing flexible spur. And this is not found in any other family um, of insects, as far as I'm aware. And this enables them to move up and down grass stems really quickly uh, and efficiently. So if we look at the cicadelidae, here are some examples. Uh, and they all have these rows of spines on the hind leg. parallel rows of spines. Almost always these rows of spines uh, are present. But of course, there are a couple of exceptions. Uh, and one of these is shown by this very large species, the largest leafhopper in Britain, and in fact, the largest one in Europe, Ledra aurita, sometimes called the eared leafhopper. So this has very poorly developed tibial spines. Um, there are very few leafhoppers in this tribe. Uh, in, in Britain and Europe, they're, they're, they're mostly tropical. Um, and this is, uh, in Britain, our species is a very cryptic one. It dwells on tree trunks. Uh, and in fact, the wings can turn green they, when they become colonized by Pleurococcus algae. It's remarkable. So you can find ones that are really quite um, green colored. And it has a very long life cycle, two year life cycle. So the nymphs can overwinter. There is also another leafhopper uh, which doesn't have tibial spines, a species called Eulopa. And the one you're likely to find feeds on heather, Eulopa reticulata. And it's a very primitive um, group within the leafhoppers. 
the, the eulopini has these very punctured forewings and very poorly developed hind wings. In fact, they can't fly. So if we look at the frog hoppers, so these are collectively insects within the Cercopidae, of which there is just one species in Britain, Cercopis vulnerata, this thing here, the red and black frog hopper, and Aphrophoridae, the other frog hoppers. There are 10 of these species, and they're often called spittle bugs or cuckoo spit insects, as well as um, frog hoppers. And they have uh, one or two stout spines on the hind tibia. These are, these are the, um, the insects that have this ring of spines at the tip and one or two stout spines um, above that. And within the Aphrophoridae, there's a kind of uh, niche differentiation such that everything in the genus Aphrophora um, is found on woody vegetation. So this is Aphrophora alni, it's probably the commonest species and that feeds on um, trees, usually in woody shrubs. Then the species, the four species in Neophilanus, uh, this is Neophilanus lineatus here, they feed on grasses. And Philanus spumarius, the common frog hopper, which is what produces these very characteristic um, globules of cuckoo spit in which the nymphs develop, these are always on, on herbaceous plants. The, the common frog hopper Philanus is incredibly variable and uh, has many, many different uh, incarnations. So this is quite a frequent uh, color form. We've also got these, very occasionally you find completely black ones. They're very rare. And this is actually an industrial melanism thing. So in old industrial areas, you find a, a greater frequency of completely black morphs. The Delphacidae, um, here are some examples. These are the ones with the keels on the face, uh, prominent keels on the face, and this very large movable spur at the end of the tibia, the tibial calcar. Here you can see it pointing inwards, uh, quite obviously. And the six EAD, um, these have very membranous forewings, and they often have a little tubercle along the veins of the forewings with hairs that come from these tubercles. And the scutellum usually has keels on it rather than the face. So here's the scutellum, and this has got uh, three keels on it. Now the Isidae, we've just got two of these species, they're so both in the genus Isis, and both species are really similar. And they're very stout diamond shaped insects and the forewings have a sort of network of cross veins. So those were all plant hoppers and this small family are termed tree hoppers. These are membracidae. They're very diverse and elaborate in appearance in the tropics, but we've just got two species. Centrotus cornutus on oak, sometimes called the horn tree hopper. With these big horny like extensions on the pronotum. Gargra genistae um, is a broom feeding species and they're characterized by this backwards extension of the pronotum. So this area here is actually an extension of the pronotum that goes backwards and you can't actually see the scutellum, it's completely covered. So as uh, in the heteroptera, the life cycles are fairly similar. Um, we have incomplete metamorphosis with these five nymphal instars. Uh, they're all plant feeding, the eggs usually laid inside the plant tissue. And again, we usually typically have one or two generations a year, um, <clears throat> usually overwintering as eggs and occasionally nymphs and adults. So as I said, all of these insects are phytophagous or herbivorous. And like the heteroptera, uh, there are a number of species that are very, very generalist and hugely um, cosmopolitan in their choice of food plants, like the common frog hopper. Um, and there are some that are very, very specialized. So this thing here, Eupteryx urticae, for example, little leaf hop, you'll only ever find that on, on stinging nettle. And the feeding strategies, um, these obviously all feeding on um, plant sap, but there are different ways in which they can obtain it. So the bigger species, the cicadas, the frog hoppers, and the, the leaf hoppers in this subfamily Cicadellini, which are generally the bigger species, 
these are actually tapping into the, the xylem, the transpiration stream of the plant. And this is not very nutritious because it's mostly just water and it's um, under quite high negative pressure. So they need these strong mouth parts to actually pump the, uh, the watery fluid out. So they often have these very bulbous faces. So these are, uh, this is Cicadella viridis, which is in this subfamily Cicadellinae. These are xylem feeders. So they've got these bulbous faces and because they're, the sap that they feed on is not very nutritious, they need to be constantly sucking it through them. And that, this means they're constantly excreting. And you can see here, a uh, little bubble of excreted sap is forming uh, at the tip of the insect there. So these are constantly, constantly uh, sucking fluid through them. Whereas <clears throat> the, the remainder of the group are feeding on this phloem, which is got the, the products of photosynthesis and the sugars. So this is much more nutritious. So they don't need to um, produce so much exudate. So most leaf hoppers are feeding on the phloem. Occasionally, um, the, well, all the smaller species in this uh, Tiflosibine subfamily um, will, will feed on the actual cell contents of the leaf. Uh, and what happens when they do this is it turns white because it fills up with air and that will produce a stippling effect. So this Eupteryx leafhopper, Eupteryx urtici, this will feed on stinging nettles. And when it does so, um, it produces this characteristic white stippling uh, on the leaves, which is the, the feeding damage. So as in the Heteroptera, there are... Uh, there's quite a lot of variation within the wing dimorphism um, and <clears throat> species will often be both brachypterous and macropterous and this can vary um, <clears throat> within the sexes as well. Often in this, these Chloriona species that live in reed beds, the females will have short wings and the males will be um, fully winged. So this is widespread in, in this, this family Delphacidae. Both these examples are, are delphacids. Um, however, long wing forms are always produced, even in, even in species that are characteristically short winged. So this enables um, dispersal. And, and as with the HETs, it's determined by, by environmental pressures. So telling the, the sexes apart is a bit more difficult um, in these insects. They're, they're a bit more diverse in terms of the morphology. So in the plant hoppers, the male genitalia will, the, the genital segment will be um, quite circular, uh, sorry, not circular, cylindrical in, in appearance. So <clears throat> this is a delphacid plant hopper and it has this very cylindrical genital segment. The females uh, again have this, um, this groove in the final genital segment in which the, the ovipositor will, will sit. In the leaf hoppers, Again, the females uh, have this, uh, this groove in the fi final segment for the ovipositor, uh, but the males will have a uh, rather a pointed tip with these, these two genital, triangular genital plates. So completely different to the um, very, very sort of cylindrical segment shown in the plant hoppers. So adult orchinorhynchia will uh, make these very sex specific um, vibrations that they send through the plant is completely inaudible to us, but they're very sex specific and they have a number of different songs. Uh, so they have like a calling song, both sexes, and each sex also has a courtship song and there are even male rival songs. And these are produced using this organ called the timbal organ. Um, what this means is that it, you can get very, very cryptic species that look almost identical, well, completely um, identical in fact uh, and they're very very difficult to separate because their only difference is essentially is in uh, how they call um, and this has only been unraveled in some groups very recently and these are perhaps the hardest um, groups to identify. So locomotion these things can can jump very very powerfully particularly nymphs which can't fly um, obviously, the adults can, can jump and fly as well. Um, 
they can produce massive g-forces when they when they take off like like insects like uh, fleas massively exceeding uh, you know hundreds of times um, gravity and in fact this was only recently discovered in uh, in in one particular plant hopper um, the issus which we talked about earlier has these interlocking gear mechanisms and it's actually the first example of functional gears in, in nature. So they have these, uh, the base of the legs, the coxae have these toothed um, gears, which mean the legs are incredibly synchronized when they, when they jump. And this allows them to maintain control when they're jumping. Right, so I'll say a few words now uh, about Heteroptera and Orchnorinca um, together um, and about how to find them particularly. They're really um, very cosmopolitan in most habitats and um, particularly habitats where you've got lots and lots of different plants because they're mainly plant feeding. So the, the, the greater floral diversity, the, the better really. Um, however, if you live in the north of Britain, you are going to find far fewer uh, species because they do prefer warmer parts of the country. You can find them using a variety of different collecting techniques. So sweeping is really productive um, where you've got grassland or herbaceous um, meadows. You, you can beat them from trees or more woody ve vegetation. Uh, you can look under specific food plants grubbing around on the ground um, or you can use quite sophisticated methods like um, suction sampling, pitfall traps. Uh, to capture them in. So a huge number of methods um, are productive. Now, um, identifying these insects um, ha has been problematic and remains problematic. So still the only published book to cover the British heteroptera fauna is Southwood and Leston. This was written in 1959. So it's obviously a classic text, but it's now massively out of date, many species aren't covered, many newly arrived species um, are not obviously included, and there's obviously been taxonomic revisions uh, since then as well. Uh, so it's uh, not an ideal book to use, it's not very practical um, to use now, and there is still no published replacement. So we've got uh, an unsatisfactory situation really in that there are two unpublished keys. Um, and these are widely available, but yes, they are unpublished. And these are available as PDFs and they cover the, the terrestrial bugs, excluding the, the large Myridae family. And this has been produced by Pete Kirby. It also includes a family key. Uh, and then Bernard Knorr has, has tackled the plant bugs and the Myridae in a separate key. Um, there are, however, books that are useful. Um, this is a, a very good general insect guide by Paul Brock, and this has 40 pages of Hemiptera in it, which actually nearly 200 species illustrated. And this is a very good insect field guide in general. And if you, if you don't have many in insect books and you want to get one, you don't have this, and you want to get one that will include lots of bugs, then I would definitely recommend this one. There are now a lot of books uh, European books published, and these do cover much of the British fauna, but obviously they're not in English, so this is not an ideal situation. Now, Orkanorinka, the, the hoppers, um, these have a series of RES handbooks. Uh, they're, they're mainly pretty old, and so they're not current either. However, you can download these from the, the Royal Ensoc uh, website and um, they are all freely available. Now, recently the Germans have produced some excellent literature on leaf hoppers, and this covers most of the British fauna. And there's only a small number of species found in Britain, but not in Germany. So um, these are really excellent, very comprehensive books. They're rather expensive, but they're, they're the, definitely the things to get if you're serious. So there's a, um, a, a um, 
the plant hoppers and leaf hoppers of Germany, the main identification key, this includes all the habitus drawings, genital figures, etc. And you've also got an accompanying photo atlas, which is a, an excellent little accompaniment to that. <clears throat> so um, to fill this kind of uh, void, really, in terms of the identification situation, Joe Botting and I, um, a long time ago now, more than 10 years ago, uh, set up a, a website to cover the British fauna. And hopefully we've got this, well, we did get it to a reasonably good level. It still needs a lot of work doing. And, and I, I really do intend to do a lot more work on this now. So if you don't know that, it's at britishbugs.org.uk. And this covers, um, as well as terrestrial hets, it in, includes, covers a lot of uh, leaf hoppers and allies as well. Um, and hopefully that's at a useful stage, but again, it's starting to lag badly behind and needs work doing on it. Uh, Alan Stewart and I, um, Alan runs the Leafhopper Recording Scheme. He's, um, in, uh, we collaborated uh, to produce this Recording Scheme website some years ago, and this can be found at ledra.co.uk. Uh, and this has lots and lots of general resources, including um, some family and subfamily keys and uh, several newsletters as well. Uh, we also publish a um, True Bugs column in British Wildlife. So this is quite useful if you want to keep up to date with recently arrived species and changes to the fauna. So first question that I, that I can see from Alan Rowland um, is, is there any plans for an RES handbook on shield bugs? I think there, there was um, a long time ago, there were plans for that. Um, and I know Alex Ramsey was quite keen on, on making that happen. I mean, I'm, I'm slightly, um, I must say I'm slightly conflicted about the you know, the, the urgency to, to do that. It would be nice to have um, a handbook on, on shield bugs, um, but they're not, you know, they're not really that difficult to identify and it would be out of date so quickly because there, there are always new ones arriving every few years. I'd rather do, if I was gonna do a handbook, um, an RES handbook, I'd rather do it on a bigger family, I think, maybe. Um, I mean, I, I, what I would really like is if the people who have written their keys could find some way to collaborate and publish those um, rather than just doing something on the sort of smaller group of, of shield bugs. But I mean, it's something that Alex and I have talked about. So yes, that project in theory is still on the back burner. So yeah, I mean, I wouldn't hold your breath though, I'm afraid on that. Okay, um, the next question is from Rita Moraes. Um, and, and I think um, it, it might not make sense. So I think it's referring to when you, when you very early on in your talk, when you were talking about um, sexing. Um, and, and she says, I have particular difficulty with choridae and pentadomidae, as in splitting the sexes. So have you got any tips on that? Yeah, that's actually a, good, a very good point. They, they can be really difficult. Um, no, I mean, in, in, the, in the field, it's really, really very hard to, um, to separate those. I mean, normally you can see some kind of split um, in, the, in the genital segment in the female, um, in, in choraids. But um, yeah, they, they can, there's a lot of variation actually. Um, and the cancer somatids are difficult as well. Um, I mean, I, I, would, I wouldn't be confident about sexing them in the field. Okay, so, that, that, so there's, there's no need to worry about having that difficulty then really, um, if you're trying to do that in the field, maybe it's uh, not, really, not really worth the, the trouble. Um, okay, a, a question from, uh, Sarah Longrig, why do shield bugs overwinter as adults rather than eggs? 
aren't adults more vulnerable? Um, well, I mean, there is variation and you've got to remember that um, most chill bugs do overwinter as adults and they can, you know, they can get their body temperature down very low and go into, go into a dormant state. Um, and I wouldn't say they're more vulnerable than, than, um, than eggs. I mean, eggs, you know, eggs can easily be predated, for example, if they're not laid into, um, shield bug eggs are not really laid into things, they're always laid on them. So they, they are quite vulnerable, they're quite big. You know, that, that there are, a lot of nutrition is invested in those eggs. So it's probably quite a risky strategy overwintering as, as eggs, as something like a shield bug. I mean, in a plant bug, the eggs are laid, you know, deep into the plant tissue, so they're quite protected. So, yeah, I, 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 I think overwintering as an adult certainly is much more successful strategy for these bigger bugs, um, like shield bugs, at least in, in country like, like Britain, in a temperate climate. But I agree, it sort of seems counterintuitive sometimes. Okay, um, a, a question from Berenice. I'm sorry, there's, there's lots of challenging names here. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to say a number of them wrong, so I, I do apologise for that. Um, that's people's names. <laughs> the, the bug names are even more, more difficult. Um, do true bugs pollinate flowers? And if so, how do they do this? I don't think bugs play a major role in pollination. Um, they might incidentally pollinate the odd thing, but... Um, no, in, in the main, probably not. Okay, uh, a question from Matea Martinovic. Um, do you remove the parasitoid eggs while preparing the bug for the collection or keep them as a valuable data? I would definitely leave any, any um, uh, the eggs of parasitoids on. I mean, that's... You know, it's actually a good way of getting records for the something like the Tachinid recording scheme. You know, um, I think they, if they went through all the photos of of um, parent bugs, for example, they'd probably get quite a few records of um, of these rarer flies. And yeah, no, I definitely wouldn't do that. And I suppose even if you can identify the parasitoid from the egg, you know, there may be some stage possible to do a DNA barcode on a, on part of that egg. So good to keep yeah. all, all of it together. Yes, I mean, um, there are still examples of, you know, um, species where it's not clear what, paras what, parasitite, what parasites they have. So for example, Leptoglossus, I think the first Leptoglossus specimen I ever found, it had a, it had an egg on it and I, I really should have reared that through because they're not well known. Um, that species is not well known for having parasitoids, so it would have been would have been really interesting. Okay, a question from Pauline: What's the purpose of the forward pointing spine on the abdomen? In in the uh, Acanthus somatids, I I really don't know. I don't think it has any purpose, um, functional purpose. Okay, and a question from Maxine S. Uh, what books, books would you recommend for Hemiptera idea? I think you've already covered that in terms of... Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a slightly unsatisfactory situation, as I said, if you want books uh, in English. Um, yeah, I mean, Paul Brock's general guide is the best thing to get if you're just looking for something general. Um, I, I would say if you are um, a Northwest recorder or, or, you're, or you ever come to Liverpool and the World Museum, uh, we have recently invested in all the, I think all of the sort of the Western Palearctic books, you know, those um, European literature that, um, that Tristan brought up earlier. I think we've got all of those. So if you ever wanted to have a look, and there was a particular reference to one of those books, 
and you're very welcome. It's sort of a non-lending library, um, apart from the Tetra books, but you can, you're very welcome when we're, well, perhaps next autumn, I suppose, you'll be very welcome to come and use the, our, our library with the, with all the true bar books that we've got. Um, especially, as I said, we, we, we do make a particular effort to, um, and we're still investing at the moment, trying to catch up in time, but trying to invest in, in the most expensive books, like those uh, German Leafhofer books, they are, they are quite expensive. So we do try, and, yeah, if, the more expensive books and less accessible books we have, that's, uh, I think that's a good thing. The I mean, I should say that that German Leafhopper book exists as an English translation as well. So it is in English. Um, and some of the Fauna de France keys are in English as well. At least the key part is in English, in French as well, obviously. But so not all of this European literature is exclusively, you know, incomprehensible to us. We can use some of it. And, and that Southwood and Leston um, book is, is hard to get hold of, isn't it? And I've seen them for like a hundred pounds for that. Well, for that it's book. now, I mean, really? it's now a very collectible antique book as uh, in its original form. You can get uh, a CD digitized version of it um, from Pisces Conservation, I believe. But, uh, you know, it's so, it's so incomplete now and the figures are very out, very sort of outdated. And um, I don't think, you know, is very very useful at the time but I think if you're if you're wanting to use it for identification it, it, it could be a bit dangerous now right okay um, next question um, is from Caroline um, can you use a bat detector to hear these sounds this was talking about the Orkinarinka and, and the graph you showed as that is a really good question. Um, I'm not sure you can because there, there are actually vibrations that go through the plant. So the, the, the hoppers are using the plant as a medium rather than the air. Like a, So when you hear, for example, a grasshopper or a bat, the vibration is actually coming through the air, whereas this is going through the plant. So I think um, I don't think that's the case. Um, I don't think you could do that. I don't know how they record these these um, leaf hopper signals, but they must use some very complicated um, setup, which is in some way physically linked to the to the actual plant the things that are communicating via. It's yeah, a good no, no. thought though. You can use a um, you could probably use a bat detector to hear the new forest cicada though, because that that is. Um, that does produce real stridulatory noises. And that was it the, the new forest cicada was thought extinct for a while. Is, is that is that right? Well, it probably is extinct, but probably it's is. Very, very difficult to prove something's extinct, particularly when it has a very long life cycle. Um, so it could conceivably not appear for many years. Um, but still be extant. So it's really hard. It's a really hard one. But yeah, it's looking that way. It's the most likely scenario is that it probably is extinct. Right. Okay, we'll go on to the next question. Um, this is from Claudia, and I'm not going to try and pronounce your, your second name. Uh, but sorry, but from Claudia. Um, first of all, excellent presentation. With regard to the Delphacidae family, is there any key to identifying the females? Well, um, female Delphacids are very difficult, I agree. Um, the, the best thing with those is to get the German book and to look at the illustrations of the, um, the genital segment. So, um, particularly the shape of the ovipositor valves and the, um, the proportions of all the various structures. So, um, well, I'll show you. Um, so if we, if we look at a species, it's called a delphacid. Uh, 
So if we can see, can you see those illustrations? Yeah. Basically, you compare those. Those three look incredibly similar. Sometimes they do look quite different. So you just have to very closely scrutinize um, that part of the underside. And it can be really hard with the, the female delphacids. I mean, sometimes they're unidentifiable. Um, you, you know, you have to hope that um, you get males in the sample, really. There's a tough one. OK, uh, uh, a question from Steve. Are there any resources that indicate those species that can be reliably identified in the field? Uh, yeah, I think I think there are because isn't all that linked to the um, the, the species rules which have been written um, for, for many taxa now as part of the MBN record cleaner and those have been integrated into iRecord as well. So there should be somewhere um, there should be somewhere a list of those species um, which can be easily identified from a photo, I think, within, within iRecord. But whether those have actually been published separately and made available, I don't know. I mean, I was partly respond, responsible for doing that, but I never actually, um, I just, you know, did it with BRC in collaboration and they incorporated those into the rules, uh, the species rules, which they use to verify um, iRecord records. So, I mean, for example, when you, um, when you enter a record into iRecord and it comes up with, it does all these checks. Those are the rules I'm talking about. And part of that was a field for how easily species can be identified. So you, you can find it within, within that, within iRecord, but I don't think the list exists in a, in a separate form. I mean, do you think that would be something that's useful um, for, the, for the website? I mean, it could be added to the website. Potentially. Um, well, there's, there's Tristan. There's a couple of um, fairly recent field guides, isn't there? There's um, with the, the, the there's the spiders to field guide, isn't there, Andy? The, and the hoverflies, and they've got those symbols, haven't they? Where for for whether you need a microscope or whether you need um, yes, you can you can do it with a magnifying glass. I think that means in the field. I think mm. that would, I think just a little symbol in the corner of some, you know, for each species account would make, well, in my opinion, would, would yeah, would, would be good. But it's yeah, quite a job, I, isn't I, it? Yeah, I mean, I like that approach. I know I know what you're talking about. Yeah, the wild guides do, books do that, yeah. don't they? Yes. It's, it's quite tricky. I find categorizing, you know, one species, um, giving a kind of coding to one species like that can be problematic because it can be sometimes that the species is really distinctive usually, but sometimes it's not, um, or the males are really distinctive and the females not. So it's yeah, quite, it's quite actually quite hard to make that generalization like that. Although I appreciate it's useful. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely, there's always exceptions, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, and I suppose, you you might just not not put a symbol for those ones that are, I don't know I don't know how what, what system is is foolproof but um, yeah um, but certainly when you yeah when you if if you if you think you you've identified one with a photo and then you're putting it in try record and and that warning uh, sign comes up and you can hover over it can't you and it tells you well this can't be done in the mm. field or, or something that's, that's, there's different levels isn't there that's right and, and and that was all done that was all done by a group of people um myself included we had to come up with with all of that um but and but as i say it was never made available separately so maybe i should go back and revisit those that information and incorporate it into the you know into the bugs website in some way it's certainly useful when you're putting in records to to have that uh, you know have that warning have that alarm mm. to, to make sure you, you're double checking things etc. Uh, right, we'll move on to the next question. Um, okay, question from Pigeon. Um, 
Hi, thank you for this really interesting and informative talk. Is there an evolutionary reason for the aloper bugs um, that lost, for, for them losing their ability to fly? And also, how do the cuckoo bugs produce their spit? Um, what was the first one again? So the, the first question was, is there an evolutionary reason um, why the Elopa bugs, hopefully I'm saying that right, for the Elopa bugs. Oh, Elopa, right, yeah, okay. Elopa, sorry. Yeah. Why they've lost their ability to fly. Yeah, I don't know really. Um, I mean, they're very primitive, so it might be that um, they, you know, they, they could never fly, potentially. They may, it may not have been lost secondarily, I don't know. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, they they don't live in um, they don't live in habitats where they they don't need you know where dispersal is not important. Um, dispersal is always important, I suppose. So, uh, yeah, I can't think of any obvious reason why that might be. Um, and I don't think I've got anything useful to say in answer to the second question either. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, another question from Pauline. Are any of the recently arrived ones invasive? I think Pauline was particularly looking at when you were in the quiz, really. Um, uh, I think because things like the mottled shield bug is a recent arrival, isn't it? So I think that's where that question had, had come from. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, there are loads and loads of uh, what we call non-native species, um, whatever that means. Um, very few of them are, are you know, what, what you'd call invasive and, and detrimental to our ecology. Uh, most of them just slot in um, without any kind of impact and they're completely benign. Um, and you know, I think it's quite important that, that, that that's, um, that's realised. I mean, People make a lot of fuss about invasive species, but it's really only a tiny minority of them that cause problems. I mean, one, one, one species that is arriving here um, and may well establish is this so-called brown marmorated stink bug, Haliomorpha. And that has been a really bad pest of the fruit industry in some parts of the world. Um, and yeah, it could be a problem here, but um, it may never really be sufficiently warm here. You'd need a hell of a lot of climate change to happen um, for many of these bugs to become a real problem in Britain because they just simply need warmer climates usually um, to have an impact. And I mean, if you think about something like, like Leptoglossus, this big uh, Western conifer seed bug, um, people were worried about that having an impact on native pine forests in Scotland um, and affecting the regeneration of, of our native pine but it doesn't seem to be happening and the, the, the bugs don't seem to be establishing up that far north and uh, it seems like the climates yeah, I think it would have happened by now I don't think the climate's very suitable for them even though they do go up to Canada I think it's just that Canadian summers are quite hot and Scottish summers really aren't, even though the latitude might be comparable. So um, that's probably not a concern. Um, and yeah, there are other examples of bugs which are a pest in other parts of the world, but not really here. The, the Southern Green Shield bug, you know, it's a big pest in some parts, but again, it's just simply not hot enough in Britain. It's a, it's a nuisance um, for most, you know, people with allotments, where you're growing vegetables continuously in heated greenhouses, yes, it could be a problem there because, you know, you, that's essentially an artificial climate you've created. And so um, that would be my one caveat. Yeah. Great. Well, the, the, the difficult British climate does stop a lot of things. Mm, it does, really does. Um. Okay, next question. I, I apologise for not going to this particular question earlier. 
because uh, we have a question from Grace, who's six, and I hope that Grace hasn't gone to to bed now because uh, because I've waited so long. Um, uh, so Grace wants to know, how do you know so much? I don't think I do really. <laughs> I mean, um, there's an awful lot I don't know. I think that's been proved quite adequately by this Q and A session. Um, but no, I mean seriously, I, I just I think it's always good to try and teach yourself things. And the reason I'm probably appreciate all the difficulties um, involved in identifying Hemiptera is that I've struggled with all the old literature um, and gone round in circles and, and, you know, essentially taught myself a lot of it. And, you know, the more you fail, in some ways, the more progress you make. So it's, um, yeah, I would say just really try and teach yourself and don't expect people to just, you know, be able to um, get everything into your head. It's, it never works that way. And Grace, if you continue to, you, you love your bugs and continue your interest, I'm sure one day you'll, you'll know as much as, as Tristan does. Absolutely. You've got quite a good head start, Grace. So, you know, good luck with it. Okay, I'll, I'll go to a question from Mark Fordyce now. Um, is iRecord okay for recording? Um, well, yes. Um, I don't know what you mean by okay. Um, I mean, iRecord is um, what BRC have produced in order to generate records for the recording schemes and also to drive records towards the MBN. So I like it as the person who runs the National Recording Scheme, the Shieldbugs, um, I, I welcome the whole development of iRecord. Um, it's a very worthy initiative. Um, obviously, there's always going to be that conflict between records going to iRecord and the schemes and records going to local record centres. That, that's always a thorny um, um, problem, potential problem at least. But no, I, I would encourage everyone to engage with iRecord. It's getting more streamlined, less clunky. Um, I mean, the user experience, I think, has always been fairly good. The verification experience has not been good from my point of view until relatively recently. Uh, it's now really improved. And I think, yeah, iRecord is much becoming much more usable. And I, I yeah, so I would say yes. I do think it's okay, and I'd encourage you to to use it. Okay, so a question from from Beth, who is nine. Um, she would like to know um, which bug you think is the most interesting. Um, well, I think they're all quite interesting in in you know in their own way. Um, I'm not sure that I'm specifically interested in any one um, more than any other really I mean I think if I if I were going to say um, you know do a PhD or some real involved further study of of any of any of the the British fauna um, I'd probably pick something something big and spectacular like um, you know leptoglossus or or one of the one of the bigger shield bugs. Um, I think they they've just got a bit more a bit more going on um, in terms of their you know their biology, but it but equally um, some of the smaller leaf hoppers are also very fascinating, um, particularly these where you get these very similar groups um, and the, the the way that they've speciated is is really really amazing too. So. Yeah, I couldn't really pick one particular species, though, I'm, I'm afraid. Okay, um, we'll, we'll go on to a question from Sitka Tepfe. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that terribly. Um, are some of, uh, of these bugs invasive? Well, I, I think you've already answered that. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll carry on a bit. Sorry, I'm get, getting lots of very nice comments um, 
about your presentation, Tristan. I'm, I'm now just trying to get through to find another question here. Oh, no, well, that's very nice to hear. Okay, a question from Daniel. Is it known why some bugs are attracted to moth traps? Excellent talk, by the way. Oh, the eternal question of why insects are attracted to light. I Honestly, you can't give a satisfactory answer to that. Well, I've yet to hear one, really. I mean, not just not just um, bugs, but um, any insect. Um, you know, there's all sorts of theories about navigating by the moon and flying parallel to the light source, so they fly round and round it. But I don't know that that's very satisfactory. I mean, I, no, I'm afraid I can't offer anything very insightful um, to answer that one either. Do apologise. No, I, I don't get huge numbers of bugs in. In the, in the moth trap you do on very hot nights i mean the very warm nights you get a real diversity of things it's when things decide to disperse but, but why they why they come to light i don't know it's... okay we'll go to a, a question from kate aylett um what website slash facebook page is the best in your opinion that you learn from the most from well, I like the Nature Spot website. Um, I actually think that's really, really terrific cross taxa. I agree. Yes. Yeah, um, and especially for things that you you can identify from from photographs, the, the mm. coverage that they've got on there is is really excellent. Absolutely amazing. Um, okay, I'll go to a, a question from. Glenn Powell, very interesting regarding the parasitoids. Is much known about egg parasitoid species that exploit shield bugs as hosts in the UK and their ecological impact? Yeah, I think there is quite a lot known about which species, um, you know, parasitize which hosts. Um, I mean, in terms of their ecological impacts, I'm, I, I wouldn't know. You mean in terms of the impact on the host populations and so on? I'm not sure. I don't know anything really further about that. But they, they're certainly the, the host specificity of these um, parasitoids is, I think, fairly well known. Okay, uh, a question from Kia Flowerdew, which is, is, is going to be testing for me, I think. I've heard the term homoptera to describe both sternorhynchia and orchinorhynchia. Is this a defunct term or is it, a va is it valid to say? Well, I used to use the term homo homoptera and I was told by someone it's defunct and should not be used. So I think, yeah, the answer to that question is that it's defunct and no longer a, a term that should be widely used. I, I, I still use it, so I'm, I'm mm. ignorant of that as well. Um, it just, it's just quite neat to say heteroptera and homoptera, isn't I it? Agree. I agree. <laughs> I completely agree. Okay, I'll go on to the next question. Um, and, and, I can, and I can, I can, I can see you actually. So you, you may pull your face when I try and pronounce your name here. Uh, Oz, Oz, Ozden. I'm sorry about that. Hello. Um, thanks for the webinar organization. Very interesting. I am joining from Cyprus. Can you please explain a little bit about the Tenipta project? Also, are you interested in Hemiptera specimens from Cyprus or are you only focused on specimens from the UK? Um, well, I don't. I don't think I'll, I'll go into the the Tnipta project um, right now, um, but I um, because I I've, I've done the you'll uh, yeah. There's there's plenty on the website on northwestinvertebrates.org.uk, and you can go on the about us page. is probably probably best. But I've got plenty of presentations I could bring up now about about it. Um, but um, we probably haven't got 
time for that. But and um, we are we are very much focused on just uh, one part of, of the UK, is uh, the Cheshire and Lancashire region. But it's but it's great that there's so many people from further afield in this. Our um, lead curator of, of entomology, um, Steve Judd, is actually his his main focus is actually on on um, plant bugs um, mainly, and 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 that's um, on Crete. So, uh, um, in particular, at the moment, that's where he's he's focused. So we we um, the World Museum Entomology Department has just had a has a history and and is continuing to do um, quite a, a bit of survey work in in the Mediterranean region, and we have a lot of specimens from that area as a result of that. Um, we've done, there's been quite a bit of work in in Turkey uh, as well, um, and some of the other islands. So if you're ever uh, yeah, if you're ever in the UK and in, in Liverpool, we, we, we have, do have a good representation of bugs from that area. But I, I don't know if Steve's ever been to Cyprus, but I will, I will ask him. And if you, if you, um, if you send me uh, your email or something, then um, I, can, I can ask him whether he's, he's doing any work there and then to, to, to get in touch with you. Uh, another question from Mark Fordyce. Do we know what range of bug groups are susceptible to carry the, the Xylella bacteria? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of work being done on that now. Um, and it's the xylem feeding leaf hoppers and frog hoppers, basically. So all the all the the the, the groups with the bulbous faces, the, um, the frog hoppers and the larger cicadelids, cicadellini so-called sharpshooter leafhoppers. So in Britain, that is uh, probably about 15, 20 species. Okay, um, well, question from Pauline. Any, any biting humans, uh, which I think you, you mentioned? Well, yeah, I mean, there's the, there's the bed bug, um, of course. And then incidentally, um, you know, if you, if you manhandle um, various um, predatory bugs, they, they may bite you, little flower bugs, anthocorids, which I didn't cover at all. Um, they can stab you. Um, nabids can give you a quite a painful bite and the water bugs can all have quite a painful bite. Um, I, I, I certainly avoid handling the, the, the larger water bugs. Yeah, don't, definitely don't handle the water bugs. I mean that that bellastum that um, bellastomatid specimen. I reckon that could give you a hell of a bite. Um, yeah. Um, in, in in terms of sort of dangerous diseases from from bugs, there's, there's is it the kissing bugs in in uh, in the Americas, in particularly in in, in Central and yeah. South America. Chagas the, disease. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? Yeah, there's two genera of, of assassin bugs, um, Triatoma and Rodneus, that they uh, spread Chagas disease, yeah, in, and the is, new, is it... in the New World. Okay, yeah, it, uh, that is, uh, it's, it's always something we, we pull out the, the drawers of the kissing bugs when we're showing people the collections, mm. um, as an example. Because um, they, they they go for your lips, don't they? I think that's why. I they're... believe so. Yeah, I believe that's right. Yeah. I'm just um, I'm just having a, a, a look through the chat messages. Um, see if I can. Um, and there's someone's asked, how can I get the Kirby key? So if you if anyone wants um, these these species level keys, then all they need to do is is email the British Bugs website. Um, and and I can and I can supply them, but the reason I don't put them up there for, for free download is a they're not authored by me, um, although I don't know that the authors would mind unduly. But but b that I, I I kind of like to restrict a little bit who's using them, so I like to know that the people who are you know using them have got some knowledge and and some interest rather than just have them as a as kind of um, you know, indiscriminate available download. But yeah, all you need to do is email and I, and I send them out. That's great. Um, 
Uh, okay, another, another question from Mark Fordyce uh, in the chat. How do they actually insert the rostrum? Is it simply pressure or is there an action at the end? That's a good question. I think they have these stylets that, um, uh, yeah, use some kind of hydraulic pressure. I think it is just pressure. There's no, there's no kind of, you know, mandible-like um, structures at all. It is just simply the stylets going in. Um, this is why they can't feed on hard things. You know, they are they are reliant on um, feeding on relatively soft things. Okay, uh, well, I, well, I think I think that's it then for for questions. Um, I, I hope that we we see some of you, you know, hopefully at at the end of next year, in in the lab with you all actually working hard, looking down the microscopes, um, with with Tristan and 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 Jim to to help you get used to keys as as uh, you know to accompany this really. Um, we'll have to ask you all to watch this again before you come. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's no substitute for, um, you know, working through these family characteristics with a specimen and a key. It's really difficult to, to do as a, um, as a remote webinar, really. But I, th I think this was more, the purpose of this was more of an introduction to the, to the group, really, rather than just a definitive means of, you know, um, allowing you to identify the families. It was just an introduction. So, but hopefully it's you know, whetted your appetite for something a bit more systematic.